so let's start. Uh, today is International Permaculture Day. And, uh, yeah. and uh, I think uh, this, I'm not sure where it started, but uh, I came to know about it uh, two years back. So last year I conducted an event in Haiti. Uh, this time I'm doing it here. Uh, just so that more and more number of people can understand what permaculture is. Uh, because I've seen lots of people calling me up, asking me the same questions over and over. And uh, many people, what they do is that they club permaculture with organic farming and natural farming. And then it, it takes quite a bit of energy and time to let them know that no, it is not just farming, there is more to it. So, this is, uh, so what I suggest to all of you is that if you have any notions regarding permaculture, just try to be clear of it. Because uh, if you know permaculture in its truest sense, then no issues. But otherwise what happens is it will restrict the amount of information that you will be able to take. The first thing is uh, when we are conducting a permaculture design certificate course. What permaculture is and the need for permaculture usually takes two days. And that is two days uh, means about nine hours. Nine plus nine. So usually we discuss that in length for about 18 hours. Already I have uh, constricting it to about 3 hours and uh, I don't know if I make it a bit longer I think people might start getting sleepy or hungry and uh, maybe they'll start getting forced so that is the reason that I am really limiting it to 3 hours so I'll have to uh, basically be a bit fast if you don't understand do ask me but there's a lot which is going to be present right? so what is Pamahaj? Is, is the most important thing. Now, is permaculture, is permaculture a word? Is permaculture a word that you will find in dictionary? See, permaculture is actually a combination of two words. Permaculture is permanent plus agriculture or permanent plus culture. I'll uh, come back to how it is permanent plus culture, but let's just for now stick to permanent plus agriculture. Right? You want to do permanent agriculture, we are calling it permaculture, how will you do that? Now, how many of you can tell me the meaning of permanent? Mm -hmm. Permanent. Permanent attained. What is permanent? Stays forever. Stays forever. Long lasting. See, you look at this. Right? You look at this building. Uh, probably 6-7 years since it has been constructed will stay like this for uh, another 50 years or so. Usually the estimate is 50 to 100 years, somewhere in between. Now would we call this permanent? No. No, no. I think sustainable could be the word. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. We will come to that. We will come to that. So, usually what happens is, in our common parlance, in our common talk, yeah, this is a permanent house. This is what we call it, right? This is a permanent house. It is going to be there probably throughout my life, right? So, yeah, it is permanent. So, when you say, uh, you know, probably some of you are saying that permanent means long lasting. You said long lasting, you said forever. Now, long lasting is also not permanent. Because again, there is a limit to what you are putting, right? Long lasting. For me, it could be 5 years, for you, it could be 10 years, for somebody else, it could be 100 years. By permanent, we are actually meaning forever. And today, do you think that the agriculture that we have is permanent? See, at the outset, it seems permanent. We have had agriculture uh, since there have been human settlements, right? Earlier, there was more of a mixture of hunter and gatherer. And then people actually started uh, cultivating on land. When agriculture actually started, that is when you had human settlements. People started living in one place. Otherwise, they had to keep on moving over to forests. They had to uh, keep on hunting and gathering and basically be on the move. People, humans actually started settling when agriculture started. So, if you look at it from that point of view, agriculture seems to be permanent, right? It has been there for that point of time and still agriculture is there. We are doing agriculture, right? But it is not permanent. And that is the biggest problem that we have been facing. How many of you know about Green Revolution? Green Revolution? You've heard about Green Revolution? So, in 1960s, for those who don't know, in 1960s there was a thrust that uh, there is going to be a problem. We won't have enough food. So especially in developing countries like India, 
what side happened was that there was an introduction of chemicals for agriculture. Before that, what used to happen uh, was pretty simple, right? People were growing food for themselves, subsistence agriculture, and since most of the society was agrarian, there was not much of a point in selling food. And even if it was being sold, there was uh, not much of a problem, right? But uh, not just during Green Revolution, but I think probably 100 years before that, what started happening was that the way in which farming was being done started getting diluted. At one point of time, you had farming and agriculture being done in a way where, as some of you are saying, was sustainable to a certain extent. Right? You had the option, you had the luxury of doing farming and leaving the land for some time. You call it keeping the land fallow. You keep it for some time. Right? You keep it for, uh, let's say, a year or two so that you can recuperate and then you are putting in some green manure crops and other things. So there was a proper cycle which was happening, not just crop rotation, but uh, you are actually doing it a bit more holistically. But then what started happening was that when you repeatedly, when land started becoming premium, when you, you actually could not leave land idle and you wanted to grow, and you wanted to grow more, what started happening was that people started depending not just on chemical fertilizers and pesticides, they also had to do monoculture. And added to that, what started happening was, uh, there was, you had to make more number of, uh, what should I say, harvest in a year. So instead of taking, doing two harvests, you, you basically had to extend your agricultural season by uh, to doing three or more. So it became very intensive and that was the point of time the Green Revolution came and already the agriculture was not looking that good. So people had, uh, to a certain extent, many people have told me that they were forced to use at, at a particular point of time to uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Right. And uh, from there, there has been a lot of, uh, what should I say, basically falling off. There has been a free fall in agriculture since that point of time. Now you'll be astonished by some of the figures that I'm going to show you. If you see my earlier presentations, you might know this. But uh, each day, 2,16,000 people are added to earth. Right? Most of you, I think, are staying in Hyderabad. Think of the population of Hyderabad. Consensus, 2011 consensus says that 68 lakh people were there in 2011. So that means that within a month, we can create a new Hyderabad. You have that many number of people being added to us. And make sure this is added. That means births minus deaths. So don't think that some of the people are anyways dying their death. So no, this figure does not reduce. And this is again not the current figure. So 2,16,000 people are being added. Now the question comes, do we have enough food for so many people? Every day, 2,60,000 people are getting added. Now most of you who are here with me today, uh, I don't think that you have any problem with obtaining food. You can obtain food, right? Health is a very different thing. You, today, you can get food, but yeah, health is different. Maybe you, uh, none of us is really healthy. And till the time I even ask you that question, you won't even recognize or maybe realize that you are not healthy. Right? It's only when somebody starts saying, oh, do you have any pain? And then, yeah, I'm not feeling that way. Otherwise, we are all friends. So like that, we have food. Uh, we have food. This is the people who are here. But uh, we can't say the same about the rest of the population. Now, the big question is, some people say that there is not enough food. There are some corporations, there are some companies who are actually saying that there is not enough food. Some people say it's a problem with the distribution of the food. Because uh, every day we see some of the other posts on Facebook or newspapers that granaries are there, filled to the full to the brim, but uh, there is no proper distribution mechanism, right? So whether we have food or not is one thing. The food not being available is another thing, and that food not giving health is completely different. Now, in many places, what starts happening is that I was talking a bit about land degradation, right? By use of pesticides and chemicals. When you are repeatedly doing it, after some point of time, it becomes very difficult to work on that land. 
Then what happens? Then we will go start cutting down forests and start, off, start occupying that and start doing farming there. See, at the onset of human kind, there was no farm, right? There was only forests. So, agriculture started by actually clearing of forests and uh, making it a farm. Right? So, is that okay? Can we start getting rid of forests and actually start getting more land? Probably that seems to be an answer. Can we do that? There are no forests left. Uh, there are still actually. You will be surprised by number. I think uh, state of uh, Indian forest report says that about 20% of India. That includes Tigarit I am not so sure. That is uh, I, I think that was not the Otherwise, the greenest, I mean, the more greeners go up. Not yeah. the and the forest. Now, if, if there are forests, uh, I am not just talking about India. Think about Amazon. Amazon jungles are there, right? Now suppose forests are there, does it make sense to get rid of forests? That's the question. No. Why? Yeah, what reason? Because this, this is a very critical, yes. critical question. Because today, uh, we are sitting here and actually saying that no, forests should be there. But how many of us really realize that actually forests are being cut down to bring food to us? Forests are being cut down uh, to get coal. You will be, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know, but for each MB of data that gets transferred on the internet, for this much size of coal block is used. Now think of how many Facebook posts, how many Instagram and uh, people complaining that why there is some fair usage policy and uh, bandwidth throttling. Right? See what happens is that our lives do not reflect our ideas. We simply don't know from where many things are coming. You know that bees are dying. You know that? Why? You look persistent. Is what one 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 bad says. Yeah, another bad says no no no, it is because of cell phones. So you have what happens is that you start playing pesticide companies, pesticide companies say no, it has nothing to do with us. We have been putting pesticides for quite some time. It is due to cell phones. Then cell phone companies say that no, it has not been proven. Then sparrows are dying, nobody knows why sparrows are dying. You cut down forest, yeah, forests are there for a reason, as you said, forests are there for a reason. And uh, the reason is so complicated that it's very difficult to explain why forests are there. Forests actually do so many things, so many things that we don't know. Uh, what happens if you get rid of forests? We don't know what kind of life form we are losing because of forests. We don't know what is happening to the trees. We don't know. There are so many interconnections, so many intricacies in nature that you can't really isolate one thing from the other. You, you start isolating one thing from the other, you start having problems. And that is how you see most of the research is done. You have, you have departments which are actually looking into uh, how a particular crop performs. Right? How a cr crop, we, uh, for example rice, what happens to rice? What does rice require? Now if you test it individually, it will re respond differently and if you test it in its natural environment, it will respond differently. So even the tests that we are doing cannot be complete. It's just like gravity. Gravity you can only talk about uh, in a very simplistic case. Otherwise, you start talking about gravity, you yourself standing here will start affecting the gravity. You are, you are creating an attractive force. So you can only have very simplistic models. So still there is a lot of research being done. So getting rid of forests, is not an option, right? 34,000 acres of additional farmable soil are required each year. For, for the 2,60,000 people which are getting added every day, you need to have 34,000 acres of farmable soil. So forget about getting more. We are losing what we have. The current agricultural practice that we are doing, we are actually losing. For each kg, there, there have been some tests which say that for each kg, now this is by John Jeevans, he mentions this in uh, uh, his Google uh, address that he is, Google Talks. Is there. He's a very respected figure in uh, agriculture circles and pharmaceutical circles. 
He is actually the founder and I think the proponent for uh, Grow Biotensive Systems. Where Grow Biotensive, where they are again looking at it very holistically to create. So he says that 34,000 acres of farmer soil is required. How do you get that? Now most of the processes, the most of the ways in which we are doing agriculture, every, uh, every kg of food that we eat, for every kg of produce that is coming, we are using actually 10 kgs or 6 kgs of soil, farmer soil. Right, so this is, this, is the, this is the kind of picture that we really need to understand, is, is what is happening. And as somebody on Facebook says, there is no planet B. You lose planet A, there is no planet B, there is no option B. You can't go to some other planet and do start doing something. Right. This, is, this is the irony of the situation that our current agricultural practices are making us lose that. And the one that we have here, we require more. Then again, there are uh, more reports that say that there are lots of soils which are actually becoming completely unfit for cultivation. Too much clay or too much, you, we call it salt pan. There is a salt pan. And you know what salt does? Plants require water, right? What does salt do? Salt takes in that one. So no water will release your plant. So you have salt, extremely different. And how does that soil come onto the farm? It's pure chemicals. It's pure chemicals and more water. The deeper you go, the more soil that you have, more soil you are getting. RO filters. What are they doing? What is the efficiency of a RO filter? Have you ever seen? How much water it rejects? In California, we are experiencing one of the worst droughts of all times. You know that, right? You know what they are planning to do? They are planning to actually drill bores which are going to take out water which is prehistoric water. 20,000 years old, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 that kind of water is what they are trying to pump, pump out. We are also not doing anything much different. Probably our bore does not go that deep. But still what we are doing is we are taking out water. We require it for drinking purposes because there is no other way in which we can get water. We require it for agriculture. Let's face it, we do require water for agriculture. But not at the cost of the future is what we need to see. So the first thing that we need to understand is, uh, as you mentioned very correctly, permanence of anything is actually decided by whether is it sustainable, and whether it is resilient or not. What do you mean by sustainable? Can somebody tell me? Runs on its own. Yeah. Can you tell me anything which is sustainable? The tree on the roadside is left on its own. No more water, no more trees. Yeah. Any other example? Any other man-made example? Any man-made example for uh, Sustainability? Very difficult to find. Very difficult. Because a sustainable system is a system which over the course of its lifetime will create enough energy to run itself. Right? And apart from natural systems, it is very, very difficult. I, I don't think you can create anything which is sustainable. You need to keep, keep on giving it inputs. You have a car. The car, you give it petrol, it goes. But it does not generate energy by moving. It actually loses energy. So again you are putting it, giving it petrol. So what is happening is, what happens the day that you don't have any petrol to give? Every bit also, I think most of the people who have come here, if you are aware or interested about power culture, you would have heard of peak oil. Right? You know what peak oil is? No, no. Uh, peak water? No, no. Peak oil is, there is actually a bell curve. Right? And uh, this is the time axis. We call it a bell curve. What happens is that this, of course, is the peak. Okay. Now, initially, 
what happened was there were oil wells which were getting discovered. So every year you are discovering new oil wells. You keep on discovering new oil wells. Yeah, it is going. Then comes a point where you are discovering less number of oil wells. So then you need to start getting careful. Because otherwise it's like, yeah, how much ever you take, yeah, bahut hai, bahut. we have lots. Right? You keep on, you can keep on taking as much as you want. But because the more you take out, the more you are finding out. But there comes a point where you are taking out at whatever rate you are, but you cannot sim simply find new. So that is the bell curve which comes. Right? So we are somewhere at the peak. Not that we have run out of oil, but we know for sure that we will run out of oil. Actually, something like this happened in 1980s. In 1980s, there was a bit of a jerk. Suddenly, no new oil wells were found. And uh, it, I mean, the, number, the frequency at which they were finding it got reduced. What happened was that a country like Cuba suddenly uh, had sanctions imposed on it. And it's like today you have oil, and one month you, after one month you have no oil in your country. You don't have oil. Whatever stockpile is there, it is over. Nobody is giving you new oil. What do you do? And that kind of condition is going to come. Now people talk about oil, right? We also know the price of oil is going up. But what about water? You know pure water is more expensive than petrol. Spring water, the small water will come for 130, 140 rupees. And we are running out of water. Then phosphorus, NPK, our fertilizers, Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. What happens to phosphorus? How is phosphorus found on, on the face of the earth? Rocks. Right? You take it from rocks. <coughs> if you give it back to soil, let's say, in some proper way, then it is okay. But what happens is, most of it gets leached away. And goes where? What is the what is our worldwide biggest dustbin? Ocean. Whatever you throw there, nothing is going to be visible. I can't see, you can't see. The, that's, that's, the, that's the mentality that you are, right? The dirt should not be there in my house. Go outside, somebody. The dirt that we don't want to touch, we expect somebody else to come and take it. See how funny we are. So we don't see the dirt being anywhere. Uh, we are just dumping it and it all goes back to ocean. Oceans are getting polluted. The phosphorus is going to the oceans where it should not belong. We don't have phosphorus here. So very soon, there are some estimates, but yeah, very soon, uh, in ecological terms, very soon means 20 years, not tomorrow or day after. But yeah, within 20 years, you won't have any phosphorus. Then what happens? The present system is only running, and I can tell you, it's only running the way it is running because we can run it that way. The day there is no petrol, most of your factories, most of your petroleum based products like your fertilizers and pesticides are going to stop. You simply cannot produce it. There has to be a way out. You have to look at the world. And that is where you really start thinking as to how should something be sustainable and resilient. Now what do we mean by resilient? This is another very funny thing. Uh, during the Green Revolution, people say that actually productivity started increasing. You talk to any farmer, any farmer uh, who has been doing it for past 20 years, he would actually uh, say a bit differently, but yeah, most of the farmers would say that yeah, the output actually started increasing after putting fertilizers. Right? I'll tell you one thing. It is questionable whether it increased because of fertilizers or because of the selection of the variety. The variety which was selected was different. You have rice. The rice that we are eating today and uh, before uh, this introduction started, uh, one lady came and she was saying that yeah, rice is leading to obesity, white rice is leading to obesity. So, one is the way in which we are consuming rice, which is highly polished rice. The second thing that we need to be careful of is 
that the variety of rice which was available at one point of time is not the kind of variety that we are growing. The tomatoes, we have selected for different types of tomatoes. We have selected for crops based on the yield that it gives. Right? So, suppose one of you, suppose you sir, I train you in your whole life to be only a sports person. Right? Until unless you have some special talent, you will actually start having problems and other issues. We usually see it with people who are very studious. They usually will have a pot belly. Right? Or they would be having deficiency in some of the other way. Because that's how the nature works. Nobody can be perfect until unless you are there in all the fields. Similarly, it happens with the seed. When you start selecting a seed for a particular trade, it will start missing out on some other trade. Right? Seed selection is done based on a trade. Right? So what is that trade? Yield. I want more yield. So what happens is, the plant actually wants to be pampered. You have to give it fertilizers, you have to give it more water, you have to give it uh, pesticides. If you don't do any of these things, it will start giving less yield. So today what happens is, there is something called climate change happening. Two years back, three years back, scientists are saying it is global warming. Then some scientists started saying, no, no, it is a natural process. Global warming is not due to man-made problems. Then tsunami came. Then cyclones came. And then scientists said, we don't know what is happening. We will call it global weirding. Something is happening, we don't know why it is happening. And today we have got a pretty apt word for it, climate change. It's a big word. It means that uh, in the month of March and April, I don't think in Hyderabad also it has rained so much. In Delhi it has been exponential rain. It has broken, I think, the last 100 years uh, record. Now what has started happening on the farm scale? In some places, there has been a hailstorm. If you have a hailstorm, most of your crops are going to get affected. So your system is not resilient. It cannot, it cannot take that blow. Right? What happens is there is some kind of a change and your system just collapses. We usually call it boom or bust. Either there is a record production or there is no production. And that is what is happening based on not just the field of agriculture. I think by now you should start thinking that there is nothing which is sustainable. The clothes that I am wearing are not sustainable. You know about 13 point or 10.5 million tons of clothes go to landfills in America every year. Something as simple as clothes, which could have been recycled to a lot of extent, actually goes back into dump. We don't know what to do with it. Now, that is not isolated because maybe on the surface of the earth we have created some boundaries and said that this is my house, your house, my country, your country. But underground it is not like that. If somebody there is operating the board, I am not going to get any water here, that, that's how it starts working, isn't it? Right? So this is what has started happening. Do we know how to dispose of batteries? Do we know how to dispose of cell phones? Do we know how to dispose of tube light? We don't know. When I started learning more about permaculture, I started thinking that, okay, waste disposal is, is a big thing. It's really a big thing all over the world and I want it to be a bit of a perfectionist. And suddenly I found that for half the things I don't know what to do. The best thing is to just go to the roadside corner to keep it, somebody is going to take it, it's none of my business, none of my head. Otherwise, where do you keep all these things? CFL bulbs stop working after 6-7 months. It was promoted as an excellent technology. What happened? Now they are saying the same about LEDs. Probably I have better faith in LEDs. But yeah, I have CFL bulbs, I don't know how to dispose them. And it is going somewhere and coming back to us. It is going somewhere and coming back to us. We don't know that. Do you know to find out whether water is pure or not, you have to do 2000 different types of tests. 2000. Now tell me after doing 2000 types of tests, if you find out that the water that you are drinking is not safe, can you stop drinking water? That's why we don't get the test done. I'm telling you, it's, it's a normal human psychology. The kind of pollution that you, everybody says Hyderabad is polluted, everybody says Delhi is polluted, everybody says Calcutta is polluted, everybody says Bombay is polluted, nobody ships from there. And 
and everybody goes in a car, increasing the pollution. Yeah, there are factories which are actually contributing more to it, but at our own end, we are only increasing the pollution. And then saying, yeah, there's more pollution over here, there's so much pollution, nobody is doing anything about it. Somebody should do, somebody should do, somebody should do. Who is going to do that? Is the point. Right? So, we are looking at things which are sustainable and resilient. And now look at what is permaculture. You would have seen this definition on the flyer. The first time I saw it, it didn't make any sense even to me. It, it, some, something is written, some creative design versus something, something, yeah, something is there. Now think of it. Permaculture is a creative design process based on whole systems thinking. That is, you are looking at everything holistically. You are not looking at only one angle. See, people start looking at one angle and they get into confusion. I want to stop deforestation. Okay. Then somebody says that because you are stopping deforestation, XYZ cannot build a company there. So, uh, ABC cannot get employment. And so, somebody else is in poverty. Right? So, you look the whole loop which is coming. You can't do, you. so you have to do deforestation. You do deforestation, uh, uh, there is a big factory, people are getting jobs, people have food, but there are no rents. So you want to grow food, there is no rent. Then you want to get in some water, the water is polluting. Most of the times you go to, even if you go to National Institute of Nutrition, which is here, you look at the nutrition table. So I think adults should be having about 2400 calories every day. 2000? And I think uh, ladies need to be having about some 200 calories less or something of that sort. Yeah. And then they will be suggesting you a diet. They will be saying that yeah, I have this much green vegetables and this and that. Oh, who said that that green vegetable has this much calories? They did some test, right? So they said that, let's say your spinach has so much amount of calories. When was that test done? Today if you do that test, do you think it still has the same number of calories? Vegetables were much more nutritious one day back, right? Every day you are actually reducing the amount of calories that your food has. It is scientifically proven. Not only calories, but yes, protein and carbohydrates. Not necessarily. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I should have said nutrition. 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 Yeah, nutrition. Nutrition. Why we are having less number of nutrients, right? Now that is what is happening. Like vitamin. Exactly. Exactly. I meant that, but I substitute word. Might not be Yeah, but this is what is happening. So, are you getting enough nutrition? You are not getting enough nutrition. You are not getting enough health. Right. So, permaculture is a creative design process based on whole systems thinking that uses ethics and design principles. Right. I will talk more about ethics and design principles, but look from here. It guides us to mimic the patterns and relationships we can find in nature and can be applied to all aspects of human habitation from agriculture to ecological building, from appropriate technology to education and even economics. That is permaculture, not just agriculture. You are looking at a whole system's design. So what is permaculture? Permaculture is a design methodology. Design methodology doing what? Design methodology which is learning from the nature, mimicking the patterns in the nature so that you can apply that to agriculture, to as you building, appropriate technologies, economics, food system, any type of system that you talk of, there is a permaculture that can be attached to it. So we were talking initially about distribution systems. Yeah, distribution systems also come under permaculture. How, how, what is the best way to distribute your food? How many of you know about food mines? Food miles, yeah. The food miles is the amount of distance that your food travels from farm to come to your plate. Right? So they do the energy costing of it and uh, various estimates are there, but for each bridge that you are eating, you are probably wasting about 27 bridges. The energy to create 27 more such egg plants. Because there is Transportation, so fuel, when there is loading, unloading, damage because of that, then when it comes to market, nobody wants to buy the ones which look a bit yellow or a bit right. Wastage. That is the kind of wastage. Tell me any business where out of every 
28 products that the company releases, only one works and still is profitable. Agriculture. The present day agriculture or the food business, we should not just limit it to agriculture, but the food cycle that we are following, that is the problem which is happening. Can we do anything about it? Is the biggest question. And permaculture says, yes, you can do something. So what is permaculture? Permaculture is a design methodology. It is a way of holistically looking at systems, not just looking at parts and isolated way. Right? You are trying to look at it more and more detail. How this gets applied, I will be coming to that. Right? But for now, just look at the definition. Now, Pavanagar was founded by these two great gentlemen. One is Bill Wallace, another is uh, David Hongren. And uh, these two people, uh, they developed this way of thinking in 1980s. And uh, it has only got better over time. Both these people are still alive and they are still making it better. They have, uh, uh, Bill Wallison actually travelled to about 150 countries looking at, right from all traditional technologies, looking at how ancients were doing it, how rural people are doing it, what are the practices in Hong Actually, that lady who came, she said that uh, she came to India expecting that uh, there is going to be a lot of uh, sustainable agriculture being done in India. And she did come to this place, she directly went to Kerala. And there she was told that organic doesn't work, we need to put pesticides and fertilizers. <laughs> so this is, this is the case which is happening right now in India. But he went to so many places where he was learning, actively learning from there. And based on that, actually he produced a book called Permaculture Design Manual, which actually forms the basis for most of what I'm talking today. And for most of the permaculture curriculum which is taught uh, in the PDC, the Permaculture Design Service. And similarly, David Holmgren is uh, doing commerce in a very, very different way. He has designed a farm. He has a small house there, living on the farm. Does not unnecessarily travel outside and tell us it is required. Even to conduct a PDC, he will call people over there instead of people. He is very, very careful about how he is spending the natural resources. Not that he does not have money. Not that he can't travel on a plane or something of that sort. It's like he has made a commitment. But no, I am not going to take anything beyond what is required. Right? Now, permaculture is very, very different from many other systems. Uh, even whole design systems, it is very different because of these three ethics. It is very unfortunate that even in something like science, where so much importance is given to rationality and so much importance is given to human upliftment, it is difficult to say that science has ethics. Otherwise, we would not have atomic bomb. Actually, by the time atomic bomb was created, many scientists actually backed out of it, backed out of the whole project. They said, no, we don't want to be a part of it. But permaculture is not like that. It has ethics. And actually, this makes it very clear. You can have, probably, you could say there is some good science and bad science, but you cannot have good permaculture or bad permaculture. It is permaculture or non-permanent permaculture. It is Informal, right? So there is no two things about it. And why? Because permaculture is grounded on three ethics. One is care for the earth. Care for the earth for all the life forms, for all the natural resources that you have, the way you are using. Secondly, care for the people. Because people, as I mean, as I'm going to discuss further, form a very important part of permaculture. So care for the people, people systems. Whatever we do should not be affecting the other person in a wrong way. Right? And third, return of surplus. That is, whatever surplus is being generated, maybe you are generating a surplus of time on your farm. Right? By doing it in a particular way, you have time. Use that time wisely for care for the earth or care for the people. You are generating extra resource on your farm. Use it wisely. Use it again to care for the earth. So in one sense, there is only one major ethic, that is care for the earth. And uh, the rest of the Ethics actually are some parts of it, but just to be clear, it is uh, as three ethics, care for the earth, for all the life forms, for all the resources, the way we need to use it, everything. So, it's not that uh, I can do whatever I want to do. You are answerable to the earth. Second, care for the people. 
right? Whatever we do should not be affecting the people systems. It should actually be strengthening the people system. And third, return on the surplus. Give back whatever is surplus, right? In spite of the negative picture that I have created towards the world, see, there is no sustainability, there is no resilience. Permaculture actually takes a very, very, very positive approach towards the whole thing. Right? Permaculture is very, very clear that negativity will not, is not going to happen. We need to be positive, we need to be proactive. So, this is usually uh, an ego view, ego view, <coughs> ego, ego, that man is at the top of the food pyramid. Right? Many people say this. And so, everything below him is subservient. Then there's an ego view that everything is important. Right? It's all a connection. Just like I was saying, we are connected to bees. Bees are connected to fruits. Fruits are connected to tree. Tree is connected to air. Air is connected to water. Everything is interconnected. That is the ego view. Then there is a power culture view. The whole of the nature as we see it today actually is dependent on human beings. How is the most important question, right? How is it dependent? Do you know what a keystone is? You would have seen an arch arched like this. All rocks are same, right? Maybe the shape is a bit different as you go towards the top. But this one is called a keystone. If that is not there, the whole structure is going to fall. Two or not. The whole load actually goes and this is called the keystone. The rest are all stones. It is a keystone. Similarly, human beings right now are the keystone species. They did some estimates, they did some calculations to find out that uh, most of the problems that I am talking of are man-made problems, right? We are mining. We are putting pesticides. We are uh, responsible for uh, whatever bad that we see all around. Humans are responsible. So let's remove humans. Suppose no human being is there. Can nature ever come back to its pristine state? Can it? It can. No. Some calculations actually say that it's very difficult. It has crossed the tipping point. What has happened is that you have made it uh, so bad that it can't actually come back. Right? Uh, it might be difficult to accept it, but that is how the, the situation is right now. We have actually started exploiting so much of the resources that are there that you have brought in so many uh, heavy metals out onto the crust of the earth. Most of our smartphones uh, that we see, they have those trace minerals which are actually not available on the surface of the earth. They are required in very small quantities, but they are still there. Right? Now what happens? They are dumping it. There was a, a picture or an article which was going around on Facebook about the kind of pollution that is coming out of factories in China where they are manufacturing most of the smartphones. It was a horrible sight to see. Horrible sight. It was just like a science fiction movie you see almost a desert and the kind of chemicals which are being pumped out they are not meant to be there on the surface of the earth. They are not meant to be there. But you know, once you take it out, you can't actually put it back. You just can't drop it and say that it has gone. It doesn't go that way. So humans are the keystone species. And that's why in permaculture, humans start playing a very, very important role. You can do right what you have done wrong. If you are careful enough, if you are looking at nature as a guiding principle, that's why. Mimicking the patterns of nature. You are looking at how nature is working, you are mimicking that. And by introducing a human element, you are able to accelerate that process in a much better way. And this is what, uh, that is why humans start becoming such an important part of permaculture. So the permaculture view actually says uh, that, yeah, as a human being, you have great powers, so you have great responsibility as well. You need to start taking care of it. Okay, so that is the very positive approach that Kamakacha uh, takes. It says that, yeah, we can, we have to start doing it. If not you, I need to do it. If not I, somebody else needs to do it. The only way that we can go forward is if 
we do. If we just stop doing anything or we are doing what we are right now doing, you already know where it is leading to. Right? So, uh, it is very important to realize this. Until now, what I have uh, spoken of Pama Hansar is more of a philosoph philosophical discussion. It looks like a philosophy. Do no harm to others, do, don't do anything bad. How do you put it to practice? Is the most important question. Right? There are many uh, systems which say that yeah, be careful, be resourceful, don't do this, don't do that. But how do you put it into practice? How you start putting it into practice is by looking at principles in common culture. Because they actually start telling you what needs to be done. Actually, Bill Mollison gives uh, a very beautiful thing even before he tells about principles. He says, the prime directive, the prime directive of common culture is that you are responsible for your own existence and that of your children. When you look at the statement, it actually looks, I know that, right? Of course, I am responsible for myself and for my kids. Who's, who will take it? Maybe some friend or some relative might take it. Yeah, I am responsible, right? That's why we are doing most of the work. That's what many people say. But you know, you can probably give your son or your daughter some property. You could probably give money. You could give something. But can you assure them clean water, clean air, clean soil? Healthy food. Until unless you start accepting responsibility at that level, you cannot guarantee that. Right? So, uh, in continuation with uh, humans being most important in permaculture, this point also stands that you have to be responsible. You have to start taking responsibility. So, in uh, how do we put permaculture into practice is through principles. And the first principle, and from here you can actually start expecting more practical examples of how we go about in formal culture. Uh, I am going to take most of the examples as permanent agriculture examples, but I hope you are able to understand the culture side of it as well. And the way we are doing it here, you can actually start doing it in terms of culture. Right? So the first thing is uh, observe and interact. Okay? So in formal culture, the first thing is to observe and interact, one of the first principles. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by observe? Looking at something, looking at that and trying to find out more about it. Understand. Right? Huh? Understanding. Understanding. Where should you observe? All around. Yeah, but... Uh, Any point actually. Yeah. But more importantly, nature. Yes. Right? What you are saying is correct. But more importantly, you need to look at how nature is working. Because you are trying to mimic the patterns of nature, right? See, you look at a... Uh, we had this discussion uh, just at the start. You look at a fruit tree. Once you have established a very good case for it, I mean, you have given it proper, uh, you have taken care that the soil is good. You know that there is enough water for it to actually, the roots to actually take uh, the water and for it to grow. You know that the air is not a problem. And especially if it is surrounded uh, in a proper place, like for example in a forest, where there is a good balance between pest and predator, the trees will keep on giving you fruits, right? You don't really need to do anything. And that is why in power culture you are actually trying to look at natural systems because natural systems are by very nature, okay, natural systems are by very nature sustainable and actually going towards abundance. Just think of how much a tree can do within its full life cycle. How much can a tree do? It does a lot. For what it takes, it does a lot. You know right how much tree takes from the soil? Does anybody know how much any plant takes from the soil? Take water. Uh, nutrients. nutrients from the soil. Uh, very little. Hardly anything. Hardly anything. So I think about an 80 kg tree or 100 kg tree would have taken a few grams. That's all it takes. Rest of it, it is taken from the air and it is developing on its own and it is growing. Right? 
And that is how a natural system works. So you need to start by looking at uh, observing how nature is working. Right? Just go outside. And if you are not actually walking on a surface, you will see that weeds are coming up, right? You will see weeds are coming up. Do you, even when weeds are coming up, it's not just one single type of weed which is coming there, are a couple of different types of weeds which are coming. Now that itself starts giving you a lot of information. One, if you keep your soil bare, nature will try to bring up something or the other. What it is trying to bring up is usually not going to be only one variety. Right? But if you are continuously walking over that place, nothing is going to come. So if you are compacting your land, nothing is going to come. If you are not compacting your land, nature will try to grow something. Right? Is the first observation that you can very easily do. Second thing. If nature is growing some or the other type of plant, okay, what happens? It is protecting the soil, is it not? Protecting the soil from what? From erosion and rain, of course. Getting washed. Getting washed away. Okay. And? Getting drying up from the sun. Yeah. So it is protecting it from the sunlight, also from direct falling of water. Right? Yeah. And as you said, incidentally what is happening is that the roots, the plant, in return what the plant is doing? The plant is holding onto the soil and not letting it get washed away. If there is a flood-like situation in a forest, okay? If there is very heavy downpour in a forest, you will still not see anything leaching from the forest. That is the power of a healthy soil. Healthy soil is going to absorb as much water as possible. Even in a 10 year flood, even in a 20 year flood situation, that is the worst possible flood that you can get in 20 years. Good soil, if you are able to maintain good soil, nothing is going to get washed. Because the soil biology is going to go in. So this is one observation that we have been able to make. Right? The observation that if some, some of the other plant is coming up, direct sunlight is being avoided and direct falling of water is also being avoided. Now the next question is why? Why? You see, you can actually start going in steps when you are observing. Oh, this is happening. Why is that happening? Now, why you are observing this in nature is so that you can mimic it in your system. You are observing agricultural system. Right? I mean, you want to do, you want to create an agricultural system, you start looking at nature for these things. So somebody is repeatedly tilling the soil. You already know that he is going against the nature. Now what happens if you go against the nature? What happens? This will be a good system. Is one thing, nature will keep on opposing you. Yes. See, they first started off with fertilizers. Right? First they started off with fertilizers, they started putting fertilizers. And they started doing monoculture. Then what happens? You are creating a condition for a pest to come. Because that's how a pest operates. That's how we as humans operate. You want to stay in a place where you have got good facilities. You would not want to stay in a particular place. Pest wants to stay in a place where it has got all the food that it wants so that it can keep on building colonies over colonies. Now what you do by growing only one type of crop, you are actually inviting trouble. So you have a you have a pest coming up. Now the problem starts. How to get rid of the pest? But in, in your mind you are looking only at yield. Right? There are there are certain districts all over India where you can't talk sense to them. You simply can't talk sense to them. You say this is going to happen. They will only say one thing. How many bags of rice will come through for Maharaj? I don't know. Parmakaja will not produce bags. They produce some kind of food maybe but not bags, right? How many bags can be created? No bags can be created. That's a very wrong way of looking at it. Suppose you look at a tree. In science textbooks, the use of forest. Forest gives you wood. 
That is just like saying use of a human being. Human being gives kidney. You can take a kidney out of human being for transplantation. You can use a heart and do some other transplantation. No. That is not how you are supposed to look at a system. So what is the use of a forest? Wood. I can get wood. I mean, it's, it's very bad, right? That's not the way that you need to think. So similarly, if you are trying to create such a system, you are always going against nature, the nature will keep on coming back against you and whatever you do, your input costs are going to rise. All the farmers will accept. You go and talk to any farmer. Five years back, ten years back, I was using only one bag of super phosphate. Today I am using two bags, three bags, four bags. Five years back, I was using only one application of pesticide. Today, I am using application of pesticide as soon as it germinates because after every 15 days, because the company said it's a very powerful thing and you don't need to bother too much about it, every 15 days keep on doing it. Whether the pest comes or not, keep on applying that. Right? You will be surprised to know that agricultural fields that we have are one of the major places where weeds will come. That is the very nature of it. You are creating conditions in soil by the application of fertilizer that weeds are going to come. So what happens? First you had fertilizer, pesticide. Now you have the Now, when you are observing the land, right, think of how would it happen in nature. If you are not looking at how it happens in nature, every time you will have to do other things. Uh, some of you were looking at my garden. Now in my rooftop garden, which is visible from here, even in the case of garden, I don't do monoculture. I will be growing tomato along with brinjal, along with uh, coriander, along with corn, along with uh, amaranth. There needs to be 20, 30, 40, 50 different types of uh, crops which need to be grown. Why? Because that's how you need to operate so that there is the correct balance between pest and predator. It's a, it's a, in a very small scale as my garden which would be probably this much area, I have seen that if there are some kind of pests coming, effects, effects if they are coming, the predator, lady bird, lady bitch will also start coming. If there is no effect, no lady bitch. Usually in my garden what happens is I have very few problems. Because if one plant gets infected, let the other plant also get infected. The predator will come and take care of it. But you need to grow it in a permaculture fashion. If you are growing it isolated, kept at that much distance from this plant, where will the predator, where will the uh, predator have place to stay? We understand that. In one of the farms that we were working on, Last year, most of you would be knowing that they were very, very few events, right? And whatever rain, uh, whatever the rain event was there, it was concentrated. It was not distributed as it would have been. So, in some places, you had almost a flood event, but all the water came on it. All the rain water came single day, right? So, in some of the places where we were doing permaculture projects, what happened was, uh, due to this rain event, some of the things which were being grown earlier, they started coming. And because there was no application of pesticide and uh, fertilizer, worms started coming to eat that. Which is expected, right? What was not expected was that from surrounding area of wilderness, birds started coming to eat those worms. This was something which had never happened. Because you are never creating conditions good enough for the birds to come. Now so what happens if a bird comes? It is going to start controlling your worms. Because worms have a tendency of even eating away the place where they can hide. So the bird is going to come and start controlling them. Very soon, if you are doing it in a proper way, the evolution as you call it, the succession as you call it in common culture, you will have a balance where worm is there, bird is there and you don't have any problem. You lose. In my terrace last time, I had lots of birds. There was a parrot which was coming and eating a bit of corn. No problem. How much corn can it eat? 
you. Right? So that kind of natural balance which starts getting established is what I mean by observing. Right? So this is uh, one of the places where I went to. And here you can see, there's an actually live example of you can see. Now this is what? This is your Tumachat. Acacia. You can find it in many places. It's a very hardy dried up crop. Of course, the monetary value of it, the way people see it is not there. Because everybody is using cylinders. Because it is supposed to be pollution free. But nobody talks about the pollution which is required to take out the gas. Nobody talks about that. It's a very clean fuel. It really cleans up everything. <laughs> right? So, many people even in villages are not using this. So, there is no per se any quality value for it. But you look at it, it is giving just enough shade. It is not completely shading out, right? Which can be seen. Things like Acacia are good in a place like India, especially here where you have property climate. You need to provide some of the other shade, even in a farm situation. Otherwise, you are exposing the land there. Right? Then another thing that you can see here is that this yellow portion that you see, some of it is light reflection, but uh, some of it is also the leaves which have dropped out. Now the leaves are very small. Acacia leaves, very small. They are not really going to affect your plant. It's not like a papaya leaf falling over one of the plant and the plant not growing. So this area, naturally, because of this falling, it is going to have a mulch like uh, condition being created. There is going to be decomposition of that and the soil here will automatically start becoming wetter. And the further we went, you could actually see that, that most of your plants are all around the bottom. That is also because they are, they are regularly clearing out whatever is there in the farm. But the ones which are there on the ponds are nearby, are doing extremely good. And this big crack that you see is the water, the force of water. There was a very huge rain, rain event, there was also hail storm. And so much water got accumulated that it actually forced its way out of the place. What was happening was that uh, it was suggested to the farmers that you have your farm, have your bunts raised, so that whatever water falls is there. But if you don't do it properly, what starts happening is that in one place this amount of water is going to be so huge and your buds are going to be so weak that it is actually going to cut across it. And when it is going, it is going to start eroding from where it is going. So you will keep on getting those undercuts repeatedly happening. And slowly what starts happening? It will start, it will almost become like a gorge and it will become very difficult to control. Water can have extreme erosion effects, extreme erosion effects. You know Cherapati? At one point of time it was the wettest place on earth. I think 15,000 mm of rainfall every year. Still it is getting. They don't have enough rainfall. And if you look at that place, you will be thinking that fully green, so much water is coming. You know, it's very rocky. Because the amount of rain which is falling is actually cutting through the hills. It's not such a good sight to see Jerapunji. But imagine, in Hyderabad you get about 700 mm. They are getting 15,000 mm. Huge amount of rainfall. So, lack of rainfall seems like a problem. Having more rainfall is also a problem if you are not adequately taking care. Right? So, these kind of observations become very, very critical in permaculture. When, when we usually go, uh, or we are talking about farms, Another thing which comes is, yeah, suggest what I can grow here. If I go to the farm, I can tell you something. See, all of us are wearing clothes. Right? We are wearing today clothes based on the kind of temperature that we have here. The same clothes will not be good enough for a person who is staying in north, somewhere in Himalaya. Not even. Or to any other place which is having winter right now. Isn't that the case? So each farm, needs to be uh, tailor-made in a particular sense, custom-fit. 
Because what the other person is doing will also start affecting what you need to do. For example, if you are going to a place where there is too much of rice farming being done, automatically because they are putting so much water, the conditions there will become humid. Right? That is what starts happening. So you need to, one needs to know, design something, what is happening there, what is happening here, what is happening there. You need to know that. So there is, there is no generic answer in permaculture. Because what is happening here can differ from what is happening there based on what is happening here. We have a small community garden here, uh, not being very actively maintained these days. But suddenly a building came up on, the, on one side. That is the best side. In one sense it is very good. Right. But what happens to any other uh, garden which is there on the other side? So you have a building, you have a community garden here, you have a community garden here. Here because it is on my west side, I am actually getting protection from the west sun. But to the other garden it is on the east side. That is going to make the whole difference. In one way my farm is going to be better. My garden will be much more suitable for certain types of crops. This garden will be suitable for other types of crops. That's why in permaculture, the main intention is always, as I said, ethics are there. You are trying to make your piece of land or your life ecologically sustainable. Whatever things that you are doing should be ecologically sustainable and economically, economically profitable. You are looking at both ends of it, but not one at the cost of other. Maybe economic profit can take a hit, but not never at the cost of sustainability going down. Because as I said, once you have created appropriate conditions, your land can only become better. It can never become worse. Right? Many people, uh, in the beginning I was mentioning about John Jeevans, right? Now he says that even organic farms, the way it is, the way it is being done, that you are using only organic manures and organic pesticides, even that is going to lead to erosion. It is going to lead to soil loss. It is going to lead to nutrient loss. Because it is not sustainable. You are not bringing up the fertility of the land. You are only taking, taking, taking. Maybe you are giving it back. Right? First is you are giving it back. Right? You have to do that effort to give it back. The second is how much can you give back? Do you get the picture? See, organic farming you are using cow dung. Right? Or you are using farming compost. Where is that farming compost being created? Not on your farm, some other farm. Are you not losing that much amount of cultivable area? That area could have been cultivated, right? It is never just your farm. It is about the totality of it. Because it's only the totality that it makes any sense. So, observe and interact has so many dimensions. There are many more aspects to it. Uh, what's the impact part of it? Huh? What's the impact part of it? Uh, what happens is, uh, can become a bit technical, you, when you are designing your farm, you really can't be too sure that this is going to work out. So you, uh, for example, I made a small observation here. It seems that on the buns it is better. So you start interacting by putting certain things to check whether yeah, that is happening or not. So you interact slowly. You don't go, okay, this is, not, this is going to happen. It's not like, okay, one day I am going to change the whole thing. Right? See, in permaculture, both aspects need to be understood. It's not as if we say that technological progress is wrong. The kind of technology that could be created today is because of uh, the immense amount of energy that we got through petrol. Is it not? Now, it is not as if we are saying no to that. We have that technology with us. It just needs to be used in a proper way. It just needs to be used in an ethical way. See, today, I have a smartphone. Saying no to smartphone and just throwing it away is not going to really make sense after I have bought it, especially. But, as responsible citizens, as ethical people, we can actually start demanding for things which are more sustainable. Is it not? We can actually start saying to companies that don't keep releasing products, half-baked products and trusting on us. 
make something which is good. For example, look at a typewriter. There is nothing much that can go wrong with a typewriter. It is at the peak of its technology. Even today, we have a typewriter which was a couple of, I mean, decades back. It will still work. It is still useful. But most of the new mixes, you know that most of the products that we use are designed to get spoiled after a certain number of uses. Because otherwise, who's going to buy new things? And I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have observed it, but I have observed it. Ten years back, the washing machine that you buy still works perfectly. The washing machine that you buy two years back, even before he's selling it to you, he's already saying that why don't you take an extended protection pack? Why don't you give me 1400, 1500 more so that there is a guarantee? What does he mean by that? Now, now just tell me one thing that you are going and doing your job. Suppose you, you, are, you are doing your job and you tell your boss, see, I can only work efficiently from 9 to 11. After 11 o'clock, it is difficult for me to work in a efficient way. I might not work properly. If you want me to work properly, give me more money, probably I can work. Or otherwise, I'll replace whatever work needs to be done. How stupid that sounds. But that is exactly the type of things that we are buying. And there is no other way. So in another sense, we need to become more responsible even in those aspects which we feel that we can't do anything about. Every, every one of us starts saying that, yeah, we want something correct. How long can they keep on running? There are some cell phone companies which are releasing almost all types of cell phones in all types of sites. I mean, he is not himself clear as to what the people want. He is not himself clear which model is going to sell. Then you are in the wrong business. Because that's not the way to create something. That's a very wrong way of creating. Every day, suppose you make chapati one day, one shape, another day, one day of shape, one day you are doing like this because you don't know which one is going to come out all right. Then you need to take a clean glass and find out what is the best way to make it. What is the most healthiest way to make it. Right? There needs to be some kind of consistency, stability, sustainability. That is what is missing. See, here is another example of a forest garden. This is how a typical forest looks like. Right? Uh, you can find all these pictures on the internet if you just, uh, and probably I'm going to put up this video also online. So no need to worry. But what happens is, uh, in a typical forest, you will see these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. You have 7 layers in an ideal forest. You have big trees, then trees coming underneath, then underneath, then some plants, then some root crops. Then you have uh, vines which are growing up. So you have this canopy layer, lower tree layer, shrub layer, herbaceous layer, root vegetables, soil surface, vertical layer. Then you have some things which are covering the ground and something like that. This is how a forest is going to work. Right? If you take off one layer, right, there is going to be some effect. Okay? The canopy layer is actually providing the big canopy. So what is it doing? It is preventing the sunlight from directly hitting the soil and also the other plants. Right? Uh, this is going to be on top of this. There is another tree which is coming here. So this tree is actually in between the other two layers. This is what you observe. Now, you go to, now not all forests have seven layers, some forests might have nine layers, uh, some forests might have as little as five or four layers. Okay, depends on the type of climate that you are in. It's a very difficult diagram. But works well for the context that we are talking about. In a tropical country, subtropical country that we have in India, the kind of climate that we have. In a typical farm, I don't have this. I don't have this. I don't have this. I have this or this. And I don't have this. This is the ground floor. I don't have this vertical layer. So the seven layers which are required to maintain the system to be sustainable, I am removing six layers out of it. Who is going to do the six sevenths of the work? I need to. Naturally, seven layers need to be there. You are removing six layers. Only one layer is being present. So who does the work for the rest of the six which you have removed? If at all that could be done, I have to do it. The farmer or the person who is operating the farm. 
Forensic is simply impossible. The soil that we have in subtropical climates, in tropical climates, is very, very fragile soil. Very fragile. You don't have that huge depth of fertility. That's why you have to repeatedly do green manure, put green manure crops and grow it in it, put it inside and then uh, again start building, building up the fertility. Otherwise you have to leave the land fallow for some time. Right? So once you make such an observation, you need to be prepared to understand who needs to do the rest of the work. Right? So this is sustainability, anything else that you is unsustainability and you, then you need to be really careful whether it's possible or not. For example, I have a rooftop garden there. Is it sustainable? No. It is unsustainable. That's why every day I have to go and give it water. Right? I have to take care uh, of whatever layers that need to be there. That's why I have that different layers. So that there is some shape, something this. But still my soil is not connected. It is there individually. So, I will have some other problems. So I need to take care of that. So I need to go and put organic pesticide or put in organic fertilizer. I have to do that. So I have to put vermi compost or I have to give it, give it compost tea or vermi wash or something, something or the other. I need to do it. Right? And this uh, one is the work with nature that we have discussed that you are trying to look how the nature works. Uh, another example. You just looked at the food forest, uh, the forest layers that you saw. This is an example which you can actually go and see if you want. This is how it was initially. Very right? nice. This is now. No, just opposite my house. Uh, this is how it was. This, these are normal housing plots. Right? Nothing great about it. The soil has been compacted. And usually what they do is that they actually fill it with a layer of moru, calciferous uh, rocks. They actually fill it so that the plot layer actually comes off. Nobody wants to buy a plot which is down, right? So that is what uh, they do before selling the plot. This is how it is. And if anyone knows the kind of substance structure that we have in uh, Hyderabad, that is a decayed plateau. You don't have soil, right? You start eating the rocks, after you touch about half meter or so, you will have only rocks. Now this was transformed into this. You have banana trees and other things coming up. The next evolution, is you have what the trees that you don't see here are going to come up. How was this possible? Is, is an example of permaculture. And this is what I was saying, the human element, how the human element works. See, naturally for this to become that, it would have taken probably 50, 60 or maybe some 500 years it would have taken. Why? Because simply the soil does not have enough water holding capacity, it does not have enough nutrients, and you cannot, most of the plants which are here love the kind of environment which is not present here. Okay? So what we did is, we did the work. This is what I was trying to tell you. We did the work. What we did was, okay, the soil does not have fertility. Let me get in some vermi compost. Let me get in some coconut. Coco bee for water holding, vermi compost for nutrition. Let me just dig it up, mix it up with the soil which is there, right? And start putting some things. Let me do a bit of watering, more than what it would have uh, really, I mean, whatever the rainfall, whatever the rainfall supports, we try to give it a bit more than that. So you start having it slowly established. Now, once it comes to this stage, two things start happening. One is that it has become very dense, so anything which is down might not be getting the kind of sunlight it requires. Okay, so that kind of thing is not going to come. Only something which can survive is going to come. Because there is no direct sunlight entering, and whatever moisture is there is being retained, it becomes very cool. This has the effects of the climate. This has the effects of the microclimate. In that restricted space, I have created a microclimate. And what that microclimate does is that I can now start growing things which would not have been possible otherwise. Right? So 
this is how you start thinking in permanence. You don't need red dirt for that? Some amount of mud was there. We actually mixed it up. You, you would be required. A bit of uh, mud would be required, but we had that. Uh, I mean, uh, although there was more of calciferous rock, some amount of uh, soil was there. But you see, what happens is that after the plant gets established, how much red earth do you think is required? Because anyone is going to go down. It has to take it from underneath. Okay. Probably you can put this much amount of red earth. And that might be sufficient only for your normal plants. What happens to trees? They have to go down. They have to go down. They can go through the rocks and uh, by finding out the pockets where they can get enough water and nutrition and all that. You need, but you need to provide that support initially. So definitely, if you have a plain rock, yeah, you won't have your some types of fruit trees growing. That was one thing which I was mentioning. Observe and interact. You might have taken observation, but once you start changing the conditions, yeah, you need to be aware. What's the size of the plant? This 200 square, 200 square yards. And how long will it take you to move from there to there? I think about two years. Two, two and a half years it is there. And uh, now it is going another type of evolution because last year there were no rains. So, this, so then it starts taking the shape of how it would have been uh, if it was outside. Yeah, it is much better than how it would have been outside, but it starts taking a different evolution. Then again, we can, I can, as a human element, go and put it on whatever track I want it to. So I can actually start providing it with the nutri nutrients that it requires at the correct time. So when you are observing, when you are working with nature, how is soil building of what really? Okay, uh, I have. You look at weeds. Okay, what is this weed doing? It is trying to bring in nitrogen. Tangen, Cassia auricular. Right? Uh, you have that uh, growing. It is trying to fix in nitrogen. So immediately you look at that weed. Oh, okay. There is no nitrogen in this one. Now, how is the nature trying to do it? It is trying to put in nitrogen through this plant. So what do I do? Maybe I can accelerate it by giving it Nitrogen. Okay, so not in terms of NPK, but yeah, in terms of compost, which is more holistic. And I try to loosen up the soil, soften up the soil a bit so that it can settle better and start having a better microbial life, better fungal network. And I make sure that I am not working on that so that I am not compacting it. For example, this forest, we don't go inside it much. Maybe for harvest, we go. Maybe if something needs to be replanted, we go. It's not something of a park that we go. Anyways, you can't use it as a park in students. Right? But we make sure that it is not being compacted. Because once you are compacting it, you are creating conditions which many plants might not like. Right? So this is one type of succession which automatically starts happening. Now this is again working with nature. I am putting in the work and doing it. But I am putting in work in a way where now I don't have to go and do active management. This is what I was telling you. And you need to think how the food forest is going to take this. What is the kind of nutrition it might be required? Now, so we don't have a plants in that way. Huh? What's the mix of plants? Oh, quite a number of plants. How many varieties would you say about 60? I won't say 60, but uh, no, please so many trees, I mean as can't put. But yeah, for building up the soil, yeah, we would have put lots and lots. There are different types of flower seeds which are put. So what happens is, each time you go, one or the other evolution is taking place. Your banana plant grows, and the pop is coming. You are allowing that pop to come. But in the meanwhile, there is no shade. You will find some of the other thing coming. So you can go there. We have Subhabal, which is being uh, grown there. You see a Yugosifla. You can go there, you can break it, and just start using it as much. You call it chop and drop in common culture. So that is one way in which you can start doing it by looking at how the nature is operating. Now definitely, this is not statistic at a farm scale. On a farm scale, you need to have access and pass and other things uh, clearly defined. Otherwise, I mean, how can you go there? Right? So I'm just telling you how you look at the nature. You looked at the different layers of the forest and you can start creating those different layers here so that it starts becoming sustainable. Now we are not here for the next two years. I'm pretty sure some or the other type of evolution, proper evolution is going to take place. There is a 
third portion due to the terms of economic depends, depends on depends on how fast you want the progress is one thing depends on how well the land can take its another thing suppose you have very bad soil uh, suppose you have something like a sandy soil you have to put in the effort of a different type you start putting lot of compost you have one rainfall and all the rolling compost is going to go down so you need to have a different technique and different approach for it. So it depends. One of my friends, he says that I want to do it in the way that a normal farmer would do. I don't want to put an extra effort. Let's see what happens. Because if I put an extra effort, the farmer who is next door is not going to listen to me. He will say that you came from city, you put an investment there and you are able to do it. But I need to put my best aside. So he is, of course, the progress becomes slow in a particular sense. Of course, last year was very bad because you didn't have proper rains. But, and we are depending on rains uh, for initial set, setting up. Once you have the system set up, then there is not much of an issue. But just to, from there to here, here, yeah, how many people this one asked you to do uh, Not many actually, not many. Really not many because once you have, uh, uh, I mean, it's very difficult for me to give you the number of man hours because. Uh, how much each worker works was different and uh, no worker came here with me, Kalyan, Uprendra, Varkana, we are the people who did the whole of this thing, this work. We got the whole loads, we mixed the whole thing because at that point in time even we, we did not know how much of it is going to be a success. We had the belief in the principle. So this was more of a proof of concept. Nobody is doing it. And it is so easy. I think uh, you would be requiring an initial effort of actually, it depends on the plot size, depends on how hard the soil is. But not uh, not not doable. I mean, two or three people could probably do the initial setting up uh, by doing it five or six hours every day for about a week or so. Not that difficult. But yeah, you need to put it concentrated and correct effort. See, usually it's, it's just like as it is in everything. Half of the time is spent in waiting. We were waiting for about half an hour. Did we talk about that? No. The similar way, half the time we are waiting for somebody to get some load, other people are not there, and other kinds of other things. But yeah, not. More effort, not much more than that. Right? And how practical it is for scaling up? I mean, really doing big farms, taking 10, 10 acres. The, you have to design it. You <coughs> can't do a food forest for 10 acres. You will simply be lost because are you doing it to create a forest or are you doing it for a commercial mode? I mean, sell it. So it's a because, kind of a quasi, for example. Yeah, if it is a quasi, then we will have to see how it needs to be done. Again, as I said, I need to know exactly how it is, where it is, and how it will work. Because even Sir was asking. And I was saying that it all depends on, first, whether there is a market or not. Second, as you said, how much human effort you want to put in. Third is the availability of resources. Uh, fourth is probably it is a very good piece of land and not suitable for that. See, here you also have to see that uh, I mean, in a farm also, in a farm scale, if you don't have a proper wind break, okay. wind break, okay. you are going to have lots and lots of difficulties. Okay. First of all, your bananas, I don't know whether I can assure you a crop or not. Okay. One, one event is what it takes for all your bananas, your work for one and a half years to go through. If you are not planning. Huh? Yeah, exactly. And that's why whenever, I mean, some people say that power culture systems are difficult and this and that and uh, is it practical? I actually feel it reverse. I mean, it is really God's grace that your banana plantation is still standing. No, no, no wind event was there or no extra rain event or anything or no hailstorm was there. Because we are actually trying to make it resilient as much as possible. And in that resilience, in the initial stages, you are actually uh, putting in more effort towards the resilience than towards uh, the actual fruit that you are saying. See, uh, you have a mango tree, right? Okay, I'll come to this example because it is there, right? You will understand much better. I think you are just thinking about it. Yeah. I'm asking this question. Yeah. Problem is a solution. Now, uh, this is another thing that you need to understand. I was saying in the beginning that. Uh, in permaculture, it is not who, it's not the farmer who goes and says, I want to grow this thing. It is the reverse. Your farm is going to tell you what it can support, what it can grow, when it can grow. 
there is a completely different ideology. It is not that you go there and start dumping in whatever you think needs to be grown and start creating conditions for that. Because if you start doing that, you are going to have to work against the nature. Right? And when you are working against the nature, you have to do all the work. Right? From de-weaving to setting up the paths and everything you need to do. Right? So problem is a solution. In power nature, what we think is, suppose you are getting too much of air on your piece of land. Right? It's very better for you to have a wind generator. What? A windmill. Your plot is more suited for windmill. Don't force it to become a type of a uh, forest or a type of cultivable field. Right? So you need to understand what is coming into your piece of land and start using it appropriately. Not that I am saying that you need to put a windmill on it, but what I am saying is you have to be that open when you are looking at it because if you are not open, you are not going to get good ideas. That's why power culture, as you, uh, in a particular sense, if you are creative, if you are imaginative, it is uh, intensive in that sense. It is intensive in your imagination. For example, uh, not that this is very imaginative, but there is a person, a power culturist, uh, who has uh, in America about 150 acres of land, or probably more than that, 150 or 300 acres of land, which he is maintaining very profitably. Now, he started putting in lots and lots of different types of food, fruit trees. To purchase fruit trees, we all know how expensive it is. Fruit trees can be expensive, especially if you are looking at that scale. One acre, two acres, it is okay. But you are talking of 150 acres. How do you start building them? So what did he do? He didn't buy it from a nursery. He bought the seeds and he started a nursery. Because anyways, I want so much for my local consumption. Somebody else who wants less, better he buys it from me. So now this is how power culture thinking is there. It is not that it is run of the mill thinking that only this needs to be done. Or it is not that, okay, this template is there. Oh, you have 200 uh, acres? Oh, okay, you have 2 acres? Okay, you have uh, 5 acres? Do this, do this, do this. No. You have to think creatively as to what could be done. For example, uh, last year, or I think before last year, last year, tomatoes were being sold for kg for 30 pence, farmers uh, were selling for 30 pence, 20 pence, we were buying it for 1 to 2 rupees. That was how bad the situation was. Because some farmers are not even harvest because they would uh, Exactly. It, it is better to it is better for it to go back to the soil. Now that is a problem if, if we are thinking of only tomato as a produce. Now you think of tomato and think of processing unit. Who made a killing? The person who was buying tomatoes or making ketchup. Because it is a preservative. It is a, I mean, it could be preserved. Preserved for one year. Within that period of time, Maybe you are selling it to pizza companies, maybe you are exporting it, maybe you are doing something else. So all these ideas come. If you can do it, you can do it. Maybe a farmer, a small farmer can't do it. Maybe you set up a cooperative for him and you start a processing unit where the profits are equally shared. It is all about creatively thinking the resources that we have. That's why problem is a solution. There is nothing like a problem. The problem is only when you start thinking that this is what needs to be done there. For example, Another way of thinking is that instead of putting so much effort in creating a garden where it cannot be created, it is better to build a house there. Actually in permaculture, the worst piece of land should be used for building up your structures. Not the rivers. That you start using a farmland for, for building up your structures and then the, the piece of land which is not suitable, you want to cultivate there, it is not possible, it has all sorts of problems. So permaculture in that sense is imagination. Uh, creativity intensive, not the other way. Now this is, uh, we did touch this a bit, but this is where power culture really, really shines, really shines, and that is yield. You talk to any typical person, right? You talk to any person. Yield, okay? how much You look at a farm, how many barriers? You look at a tree, how many fruits? You look at Maruti, you can yeah, exactly. Kitra Devi is, is the only thing that people are thinking of. This is the most, I mean, one of the most popular examples in culture. When we look at chicken, 
some of them might be thinking tandoori chicken, butter chicken and all that. But in pharma culture, when you look at a chicken, it actually represents quite a bit. Let me tell you. You have certain inputs to a chicken, what it requires. There are certain outputs which come from a chicken. Right? I hope I am not offending anybody uh, who is not uh, uh, non-vegetarian, I mean, who is vegetarian. Right? But I uh, am saying that just look at it as an example. You look at a chicken, usually you are looking at it only from uh, probably the meat or the eggs point of view. But that is not the way to look at it. You need to look at it differently. See, a chicken has requirements of shelter, some kind of a structure where it can stay. It requires dust to scratch itself. It requires water, air, food and other chickens to keep it company. Right? Now what are the outputs? Chicken gives eggs, meat, feather, manure, heat, methane, etc. What do you mean by heat? Chickens, if you have them close together, or even we give heat, right? We ourselves are at a particular temperature. So you can add the... I'll tell you, it will kick out, right? It gives them. It is, it is at a particular body temperature. The manure that it gives is there. Then it is also giving out, releasing methane. This is how, this is what a chicken is doing. Now, this is the English that I was about to talk then. In power culture, we have something called work and something called pollution. And it will relate back to the chicken example that I was talking about. Work in power culture is anything where you have to do the work. That is, you have to put in there. Pollution is anything which you can't make proper use of. That's what you call pollution, right? Pollution, I what is pollution? Anything that you can't use, make use of. Now, you have a chicken, right? You look at its requirements and you look at its outputs. Okay? That's what you are looking at. If your chicken is somewhere near the garden, you don't have to need to give it dust. It will get the dust on its own. From your house, it is going to get water, air, and whatever food stuff that you have. You don't need to specifically go and get some kitchen uh, chicken feed, right? You can actually get it from your house. You start looking at its outputs. Your eggs need to go to the house. Manure can go either to your garden or to your farm. Methane can be used for creation of uh, what do you call it? stove. Use gas. Gas. And your heat can be used for greenhouse. In India. We have too much of heat, but uh, there are some power cultures. What they do is that they have their house, they have just a small opening where there is a glass house, right? They have a chicken which is staying there. Chickens are staying there, and because the chicken is staying there, it is maintaining temperature at a particular this thing. Your glass house is going to reflect heat into the house. Now, what happens is if the glass house starts becoming too hot, the chicken is not going to like it. Right? So it is going to go out for a straw. So you have a natural AC. You don't have to turn any knobs. If you come inside, the feed is there, or your kitchen scraps, whatever you are giving is there, it comes there, scratches. All these things can be made use of in permaculture. So in permaculture, you are always trying to connect one element to the other. See, how do you make Abundance in permaculture is the biggest question. That's, that's the question that you have, right? At the back of the mind, we are looking at how is that abundance being created? How are we created? If it is just like a normal farm, but with uh, some other stipulations, already in a normal farm, I am not able to get anything. Now you put some more stipulations, how does it work? How it works is that we start connecting different elements. I will be giving you a few examples later on as to how people start collecting different elements and how they have been able to make it much better. So already you see, your chicken is properly linked to your, the inputs are being gotten, it is giving the correct outputs. So your garden or your farm does not really require any manure to be brought from outside, if you have enough quantity being generated. Then it gets linked to your farm, your farm is again creating some of the other waste which can go either back to the chicken, or it can go to your compost pile. Now your compost pile, uh, either you can create a compost pile or you can create a compost pit that can go to your biogas plant. So your biogas plant is going to create gas. 
the residue again can become can go to the agriculture field. You mix that with the water which is anyways going to be a farm. You don't need to do anything. Everything is linked. Otherwise, everything is a problem. For a typical farmer today, everything is a problem. You have to get your dung from outside, you have to get your fertilizer from outside, or if you are doing naturally, your compost from outside, then you have your agricultural waste. Because you have applied pesticide and fertilizer, you are doing monoculture, you really cannot use the agricultural waste because there is a tendency that pests are going to continue. So what do you do? You have to burn it. Then you burn it, you are making the soil basic. You are adding more ash to the soil, it is becoming basic. That's why the next crop is not going to come, so you need to make it again acidic. So again you are putting in fertilizer and the chain of pollution work. Pollution work keeps on repeating. If you are able to integrate this, then what happens is you don't need to work. It's all about the relations and how it starts getting connected to one or the other thing. That's why another principle in power culture is integrate, not segregate. Okay, so this is uh, I was talking about. So look at this mango tree. The first thing, even when I saw all of them, I, there are no fruits. Okay, usually we are looking at mango tree for giving its fruits, right? Maybe if you are looking a bit longer after it matures, maybe for the right? That's all. We are looking either. Uh, you are looking either at it from the point of view of uh, the fruit that it gives or the temper type of fruit. Okay, this is a mentality where you are actually restricting the yield. You have so many yields. Don't you think that it is giving a very good shape there behind it? Right? Can't you use that creatively? One point. You have your leaves falling. Right? So, can I use those leaves creatively? Can I make any ex extract out of uh, mango leaves? You see how the, the thought process was about? You have your mango tree right now planted. It is not going to be of that size. It is going to be of this size. So, you have one here, let's say one here, and these days they are packing it a bit densely so that later on you can cut it. But still, you have one here, one here. You have the gap in between. Can I grow something here? You see how the thought process is? The thought process is always try to see how you can integrate. Don't look at anything from a uh, particularly a single point of view. You look at this beam, a pillar, and that is the beam. You look at the pillar and you say that this is for uh, support. This is a structural support for the building. Yes, it is a structural support. But I can also lean on it. A small thing can hide behind it. I can drive something important from it. You see so many functions it is doing. Actually in our life, that's how we do it. We think like that in our life for most of the things, but when it comes here, uh, it becomes difficult. We start putting in the economic equation, the economic quotient, and the whole thinking goes haywire. You are not able to look at it totality. That is the biggest problem. Because the fundamental clarity that your natural system if you are able to make it better, it is only going to grow, go towards abundance. It is going to grow towards abundance. That fundamental thing is not there. Because see, what are these people doing? They have power. So, if there are too much of leaves falling, it doesn't work. So, they have to, somebody has to continuously monitor it. Now, what do they do with the leaves? Definitely see that they are not doing any mulching. So, next what they are going to do, they have to burn it. So, they have to hire a person to do that. Then there is a garden which needs constant watering. So, you have basically created a natural system into a very unnatural system where the relation is work pollution. Work pollution. The more they work, the more pollution they work. So, uh, another concept in power culture is called zones. And this is another energy efficiency principle. Uh, the figure might be too small, but you can see concentric circles. This is a very typical example. Don't think that it would be like that in your uh, farm also. But, for example, you want to design something, right? In your kitchen, okay, for those who are cooking. In your kitchen, what is it that you require very regularly, almost immediately? Probably lighter. Lighter is something which you require almost immediately. Most of the work you are doing near the stove. 
So most of your masalas are somewhere nearby, or your condiments are somewhere nearby. Rice could be there at one corner, right? But most of the things that you require immediately are there in a particular area, which is very close to you. That is what we call zone zero. Just outside your house, if you have your garden, okay. Every day you you are anyways going out and coming. Because you are going out and coming, while you are going, you can drop the water. While you are coming, you can take out the harvest and come inside. But instead of if you keep your garden, let's say 20 meters away from your house, every day you are going to your garden at least once. That is going and coming back. Right now, 20 meters might not look much. Every day you are walking 40 meters. So in a week, how much are you walking? In a year, how much are you walking? Not that walking is bad. <laughs> but the effort that you are putting. So based on the number of occurrences, the number of times that you need to visit a place, you divide your place of habitat or your farm into different zones. For example, your tomato or your eggplant is going to yield once every uh, two, two and a half months. So you can have your tomatoes a bit far in your garden. But your green vegetables are going to be required every day. And they come, let's say, every 10, 15 days or 20 days. So that needs to be near. So this is how you start looking at where should my cattle shed be? How many times I need to go to the cattle shed? Right, how many, for example, you have a fruit-based system, fruit trees based system. Where should fruit trees be? Your bananas probably would be better nearby because you need to go there frequently. This is one way of looking at it. Not that everything is based on zones only. Common uh, is an iterative design process. So based on this, you come to one uh, possible view. You go on step other, you come to another possible view, and that's based on that you decide. So don't take these things literally. But your banana plant will give you harvest within uh, one year, one and a half years. Your mango is going to take quite a bit of time. So where you should plant what in a particular sense can depend on that. But more importantly, the number of times that you go, you need to go to a place should be near. And the number of time, and if you need to go to a place, the least number of times, it can be pretty far. That's why most of us usually prefer having our house, our house and office next. I mean, it's pretty near. Why? Because you need to go there every day. That's why you want your kids to be studying in a school which is nearby. Right? But your place of excursion, you want to go to a picnic. Nobody wants to go to a picnic to a nearby park. You want to go to some place else. Because you are anywhere going once a year or twice a year. And think of it in that sense. Right? So this is how the concept of zones work. So you have your house as zone zero, then you visit your kitchen garden, which becomes zone one, then probably you are a bit semi-intensively cultivated that maybe let's say your banana plantation or things could be nearby, papaya, banana, which you might be taking uh, pretty regularly, I mean maybe once every six months, four months. Then you have uh, occasionally visited, uh, visiting, you might be occasionally visiting large uh, fruit trees, that is maybe once a year or twice a year you go just to see how it is. And there, then there could be your timber trees, where you don't need to go at all, they are just growing. So based on that, you start designing in permaculture. This is one concept. The other concept is called sectors. And uh, just to give you a brief overview of sectors, what you do is, this is your north, east, south and west. This is the area from which you, you are going to get hot winds in summer. Is it not? In India. From west, we get hot winds. Right? That is an energy which is coming, like I was talking about the wind. Right? That is an energy which is coming. Similarly, uh, you are going to get winter cold winds, let's say from northeast. Now again, this gives you an overview of how you should be designed. If you have something, let's say you are, uh, um, you are getting very strong winds, let's say from this side. Now strong winds, not only do they have energy as in terms of blowing things out, but they can also start drying off your crops. Right? 
whenever they have hot winds, actually winds are one of the main causes for surfacial uh, evaporation, not just the sun. Whenever you have wind blowing, it takes in whatever moisture is available at the surface, so that can become quite tricky. So, you have your summer hot winds coming from here, you might want to grow some particular type of plants here. Some particular type of plants here. But once you have your windbreak type of plants here, maybe the next row or the next circle that you have, you can grow something uh, which is better. I mean, something which can give you a different type of yield. Maybe a monetary yield. Right? Otherwise, what will happen is you start putting your mango trees or some other kind of fruit trees all over. The ones which are there are not going to perform well. Because that condition, because the tree which is here and which is here is very different. We used to go to a uh, coaching class and uh, when, when our time gets over, about 100 to 100 people come outside. Okay, all my friends and some people in my room. Now what happens is when people are crossing the road, nobody wants to be at that edge. Because anyways you are not waiting for the red, red light signal, you are crossing the road. So who wants to be at that edge? Everybody wants to be in the middle or this edge because if anything happens, it should not happen to you. Similarly, you start putting your plants there, definitely the plant which is here will be performing differently from the plant which is here. The same way, you are there in the fan, I am not here in the fan, you are performing differently than me, you are not sweating as much as I am. So that kind of differences do start coming in. The creativity is in growing something which loves sun, which can take, which actually becomes better with wind coming. You might have certain kind of timber trees which can become more strong if they are having wind continuously being applied to it. That is creative thinking. Not just limiting ourselves to those four or five fruit trees, four or five commercial cash crops, and four or five uh, vegetables that we are used to eating. There is so much diversity, and in a place like India, it is simply unbelievable. Even on roadside where nobody bothers and no uh, concern is there, you have edible crops being grown. I am not sure how many of you have observed, but while coming on the roadside you can see what are most of the plants that you see are edible. They are uncultivated, uncultivated edible crops. They have them just growing. Right? So, this is another way in which you think of the energies which are coming onto your farm or onto your house and how you start doing it. So just don't think that this is related only to the farm. Think of it as your house. Suppose you have your bedroom on the west side. It is going to get hotter and hotter. And by the time it is evening, anyways your cement is going to absorb a lot of heat and it is going to keep on radiating that heat onto you throughout the night. And I am not sure how many of you know, but fan is a very bad invention at least for you. Hot air rises, it sends back that hot air. And after some point of time, we actually start getting tired. Because the carbon dioxide which is going up is again being pumped out and we are breathing the same thing. Right? So, that is again a sort of thinking that you would see in conversation. Not seen otherwise. Right? So think of it in a very holistic sense, not just, uh, and this is one of the design tools that we use. Uh, we are getting nearer to the end of the presentation. Uh, this is an example of Takao Furoru. He he's started doing something called duck rice. Okay? And this is all about connecting different things. For rice you require water. So why do the water alone? Can't you introduce some ducks into it? Right. Now what will ducks do? Ducks are not just going to be like those uh, plastic ducks that we have. Uh, right. They are going to be active. It is going to give manure. The manure which it gives is going to again go back into the water. So it's going to make it better. No, that's not it. Uh, duck will keep on moving, flapping it, wings and all that. What does that do? Air it. Second, it is going to move the water. Now if the water starts moving, the rice plant is under some kind of stress. It is not standing still, water it is moving. So the type of rice which starts comes, the stalk starts becoming a bit thicker. 
right? And uh, what he is able to do is by connecting these things, right? He has <coughs> duck integrated with rice. So he has rice, duck, duck meat, vegetables and fish. And from six acres, he is able to provide all these three, all these five things to about hundred families. That and is the kind of productivity. Vegetables also he is he's growing. The whole farm is not like this. Of course, that again would be okay. stupid. Again, that, that, that's not something which you would want. You would start thinking very creatively as to what to do with that water. That's what I am saying. Uh, whatever resource that you have is very, very critical to start thinking as to how possibly you can use it. That's why it is all about getting ideas, ideas. I tell you, and I have uh, not mentioned it here, but uh, usually you have uh, your buffaloes, cows, and they start getting infected by lice and ticks and other things. They just want to scratch themselves. What Bill Wallison, what he does is, he not only uh, cows and buffaloes, he also has animals of different types of things and other things. So what he did was, he keeps a slanted pole. Right? Just like the railway crossing that he had, but at an angle. Definitely the bigger animal is going to come from here, the smaller animal is going to come there. And on top of this, what he does is, he puts cloth and puts different kinds of oils and other, other kind of things which needs to be rubbed onto the cow or buffalo and other poultry animals. When they are coming inside, they only rub themselves and go inside. That is work ready, right? It is so. So that is the kind of creative thing. Now, now tell me, can't we come up with these kind of creative ideas? If you just start thinking what has become very cliche outside the box, let's start thinking outside the farm. We can come up with these kind of things. He has a door. You know, it is a self-closing door. Why? Because it is not at this angle. Usually your doors are at this angle, so you have to close it. He has it slanted. So while going out, you have to push it. But once you leave it, it automatically closes. Such a brilliant idea. Why did he get that idea? Because once he forgot to close and all the cattle went down and it became quite problematic. So he started thinking, I mean, how should I reduce the work? And I am mentioning only Bill Morrison, but there are lots of people in permaculture field who are doing this right now. So Takao Furono did not learn about permaculture and do it. He did something which today we are calling permaculture and appreciating him for what he did. And he had his own, uh, it's not that he thought it happened. He took seven years to perfect that system. And today he, he came to India also. Nobody listened to him, that's a different case. But he, he has been to many places. And he came specifically to Andhra. <laughs> this person, Takao Puruno. He didn't come. Bill Morrison came. Masanamu Fukuoka came. It's not that uh, power culture word did not spread in India. It didn't take off. That's so, we are actually trying to make a system which is extremely uh, resilient and it is not just a matter of technique because uh, in organic farming also, what John Steven says is that you are losing about three to five and a half, uh, he says pounds, but you can say kgs, three, three to five and a half kgs of uh, farmable soil for every kg produced. So, if you are still losing quite a bit in most of the ways in any other way, actually, apart from normal culture. That becomes very, very critical because you can never get that back. Do you know that Iraq, when you think of Iraq, what do you think? Desert, Gulf War and all that. It was once a part of a fertile crescent. Do you know that? There is a crescent. If you look at uh, the Earth map, moon crescent, that kind of shape. It was once a part of that. Petra and other places, there, uh, Iraq was called the bread basket. That was the kind of things which were growing there. But due to wrong way of land usage, wrong way of cultivation, what happened was, today it has become a desert. So you have, it's not that uh, there are only uh, natural deserts, there are lots of man-made deserts. And in, in a place like that, where there is a man-made desert uh, in uh, Jordan, how much it's called Jeff Lord. He is actually trying to reap in that area, which is actually a desert. So, how is that possible? How is that possible? You, I'll, I'll take another example.
So for the previous example, yeah. uh, because we already have water, we already have duck and rice. If we have fish, will it be any better? Rice fish farming is also being suggested, also being done. It is, it is, it is being done. There is a system of farming, traditional system of farming called Pokkali in Tamil Nadu. There, uh, what they do is, uh, in the same piece of land, but not at the same point of time, they grow rice and they also grow fish. The fish actually comes, I think that's a soil, uh, sea water fish that they grow. And the rice also they are able to grow. Actually, they are very, uh, they are, India was, I think, home to about 50,000 different varieties of rice. And today, even if somebody says they are 100,000 or something, I think you and me know only three or four. Sona Masuri, Basmati, Nelur rice, and you don't know many other types of rice. So there were rice uh, varieties which were actually uh, resistant, soil tolerant, drought tolerant. Today, you have a system of rice intensification, SRI. What is happening there? You are actually giving less water. You are giving water through drip irrigation or in different way. And still it is working. So in that sense, uh, we can do it. It is being done. We have the appropriate variety, we have the appropriate type of fish, definitely can do But again, we need to be holistic. What is happening is that usually people start doing fish cultivation in inland, they start bringing the salt water, and after some point of time, that land becomes horrible. You simply can't do anything. You have saltified the whole land. If you're not careful and if you're not doing it holistically, what starts happening is that it starts becoming extremely polluted. Fresh water fish. You can do fresh water fish. You can do it. Okay. Yeah. 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 But uh, again, you try to integrate it, there, there are lots of systems in which uh, these kind of things get integrated. Because if you want to do, if you want to bring in the water level, suppose you have water, then you have to look, are there any traditional societies where they were doing farming by involving water? And then you will come across lots of things. And then you start integrating it, you will start understanding it. See, even at the bank of the river, or the pond, right? There is a way in which you should uh, create a pond. For example, you can create a pond in a circular way. You can create a pond in a zigzag way. The surface area is same, but the edge has increased. Edge in any natural system is the most productive because it takes resources from here and from here. You have a land and water edge, it is the best. See, this room is there. Most of the dust is going to get accumulated at the corner. That's the edge. The edge will always be special. Then from the both the other media that it is coming to. So you you make an edge like that, and now start thinking that you have a slope. The water profile start thinking that on the edge the water is going to get soaked in, but the water which gets soaked in at the bottom is going to be more than the water which gets soaked at the top, right? But still it is going to have more water than what is there on the land. Definitely. So you can grow one type of crop here, one type of crop here, one type of crop here. You can grow, let's say, your uh, Arabi, Chavadumba. Right? You can, you can grow that where you have too much water. Then you can use something which requires less water and something which requires lesser water. But if you keep your pond open like this in a place like India, it is going to get evaporated very soon. So what do you need to do? What type of tree should you put? So should you put a tree which can provide food to the fish which is there inside? Again, if you are trying to do only one type of fish, you have to put in the effort of seeing to it that it does not over multiply. You have to be very regular at the harvest. But if you try to have two or three different types of fishes, then it is going to be a different ecosystem. It is trying to self-regulate. But if you only have an open pond, then what is going to happen? There won't be any hiding places for the smaller fishes. Bigger fish will 
you can treat all small fishes. So you need to provide a different type of habitat. You understand how the more you want to make it efficient, the more you want to make it better, the better overall it becomes. You look at it only from one point of view, fish, again, you look at fish and rice, okay. Fish, rice and something else, maybe some fruit tree, maybe some other tree which also likes to be near the edge of a pond. Do you understand how you can start thinking about it? So the more you start interconnecting, the more you start integrating, the more relationships that you have, the more your productivity is going to be. That is the power of permatology. You can actually start connecting things in lots of different ways. Have you ever uh, looked at bamboo as a part of permatology? Ah, why not? Why not? Bamboo is uh, really good for lots of things. Not just for the acidic mulch that it gives. We actually have bamboo in one of the forests. The, the one which I, uh, you saw, it, it had bamboo also growing in it. Not just for its own uh, timber value, but it has been used as a trellis. Again, you need to start thinking how it can be used. It's not windbreak erosion. Windbreak. Windbreak as an erosion. Uh, I think uh, for tsunami, I think bamboo is what they were suggesting. Because bamboo is a grass, essentially. It can really hold the soil. Really, really hold the soil. So what they said was that when the tsunami is coming, don't run away. Go towards the bamboo and hold it like this. Tsunami is going to make you go up and down. That's it. But you keep holding it. That's the best way. Because nothing is going to happen in bamboo. And even removing bamboo, it, it, it is difficult to remove bamboo even through a JCB. <laughs> that is one of the main problems that farmers don't want it. You see, anything like this we suggest. Oh, no, 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 the roots are going to go in a particular way, we can't remove it. So, it depends on how you, have, you want to use it. Now, you think of it creatively. If suppose bamboo roots were so good and it was so prolific in its growth, why didn't bamboo overtake the whole of us? Some people have these kind of misconceptions towards certain trees. No, 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 we are not going to put that type of tree because it is going to overtake the whole ecosystem. If it was that invasive, then it would have been very different. It would really have been invasive. And secondly, anything becomes invasive when you are giving it the right conditions. You change the condition, it is not going to be invasive. You have soil, that's why it is growing, right? I remove the soil, is it going to grow? No, right? So like that, you have so many solutions. If we are not thinking about it holistically, then what happens is we get into this soup. No, no, no. What will I do? No, this cannot be done. No, this cannot be done. That's why the initial motivation towards permaculture should be based on ethics, should be based, based on the correctness of the process and looking at ecological sustainability. Believe me, economical profitability will follow that. It has to follow. There is no other way. Because you are getting some of the other productivity. There are people who are getting nothing out of their farmland. I have, I have spoken to farmers who don't want to grow certain types of trees because they say, no, no, this land is only meant for crops. I, I, I didn't know that there was particular piece of land which is only meant for crops and trees would not want to grow there. This is nice land. Yeah, this is yeah, this is this kind of land. And that's why the opportunity is never going to increase. And that's why the stability is never going to increase. In permaculture we have a saying, diversity leads to fertility, fertility leads to stability. You remove diversity, fertility, you have to work. And if you are working towards fertility, forget about stability, it's not going to work. Because you are actively doing work. Just like I do it on my rooftop garden, some people have to do it over acres and acres of land. That's it. There is, there is no difference over there. This is another example, uh, in another extreme example. He is a and he lives in Austria. He lives at a, at a height of about 1500 meters. So just to give you a rough idea, Shimla is about 2200 meters, with that height. And uh, he lives on basically a mountain. It's not that it is at a height and a flat land, it's a mountain, so there is steep. And this person, he is called a rebel farmer for lots of reasons, but that person is able to grow citrus fruits there. Citrus fruits? Yeah. At that time. How? How? That is the engineering. What he does is, he has terrace, terraces made, he has water ponds, sunlight hits that, heats the stone. I have my citrus plant there, citrus beds, they heat it once. Come again. You have your, it is terrace, terrace land. So you have a pond. Pond has water. 
sunlight, slanted sunlight comes at that time, it is in Austria, it gets reflected. I have my stone wall here, stone mounted here, it gets reflected to that. That becomes heat, uh, heated enough. I have my plant here, the plant gets the heat it requires. Basically, you are creating a microclimate even at that large scale. He grows only exotics, only exotics. He's not really bothered about the normal things because he has enough market. Why he's a rebel farmer? It, it, it's, a, it's a very funny story. In that area, the government has made a regulation that you cannot grow these kind of things. You are only supposed to grow only for a space. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. So they find him. He said, I'll pay the fine, but I'll do what I want. The people who are in other places, they have bores, they have water, but uh, they don't use it because for those trees you don't require. So he uses it once a year, collects all the water in his ponds, and throughout the year he just keeps pumping the water back and generating electricity. So what started happening was that he was actually cutting trees and giving it to people and uh, he was creating different types of potatoes and all that. And uh, all the different types of chefs were coming in and coming from, so the government didn't like it. And we are putting the restriction and he's still able to do. So they started saying that they wrote a regulation that a farm cannot be like this. So he said, mine is not a farm. Mine is an entertainment place. So they said, we are going to charge entertainment tax, which is very high. Charge them. What he does is, he has an entrance tax for anybody who comes inside. Right? And Along with the tour of the farm, you can basically take whatever you want. You have two bags and you can basically take whatever you want. There is some standard fee for it. And uh, it's not like everybody wants to take everything. So it works well. So the government said that if you are saying it's an entertainment place, how are you selling this? You are not supposed to sell farm produce. He said, I am not selling it. They are stealing it. It's your responsibility to stop it. How are you? Why are you coming and asking me? I am an old man. I am a single person. How can I manage it? People are coming here and stealing it. I am not allowing them to do it. And still he is able to make profit. That's why he is a rebel farmer. <laughs> so he was doing those techniques way back then. And today, uh, <coughs> he's again, uh, not just in his climate, but he is coming because he understands nature so intuitively. He is actually helping in uh, places which are extreme dry ones. He is helping them also get restored. And he is uh, in that sense a farmer and a businessman and a man of he knows what needs to be done and he knows what he should get out of it. He is running it very beautifully, very successfully. So, uh, this is the last example and uh, thank you all for joining us.